notes, which we didn't really love that option. Option two uh, was to sell milk to the co-op and not get paid for it. And that definitely wasn't an option. And option three was to find another way to utilize that 15% of milk that the processors couldn't use at that time. So this is when we were seeing that breakdown in the supply chain where you know, the schools were shutting down, um, the colleges were no longer in session. So these processors just couldn't pivot fast enough to from the industrial sized, you know, sour cream or cheese um, down to the retail sized packaging. So we were also seeing um, bare, bare shelves at the grocery store as consumers. So uh, my husband and I found a co-manufacturer that would take a portion of our milk and they would bottle it for us. Um, and then we could put our, our brand on it, our label on it and sell it as ours. So at that point, um, I kind of went into a little bit of panic mode because I had never had to sell our own product before. Um, we didn't have a brand. We didn't have a Facebook page for our farm. We didn't have any of that. Um, so we were really in a pickle because I had to find a way to, to reach our consumers or potential buyers so that we could sell this end product that we were making. So um, didn't have a Facebook page, didn't have a website, but the first thing I did was go to social media. And one thing that I really want to say um, is that I don't have any professional training in this. I didn't go to college. I don't have a degree in social media or marketing, um, but we had the need to sell a product and we did this out of necessity. So I say that just for anybody on the call that feels like they don't have the proper training to do this, because if I can do this, anybody can do it. Um, and there's no right or wrong way to do it at all. So you really just have to um, utilize your personality and your strengths to make your social media a reflection of your business as a whole. So that's my TED talk for the day. If I can do it, so can you. And I just wanted to share a short video. It's about three minutes, so bear with me. And then uh, we will continue on from there. So let me just see if I can pull this up here. Bear with me, you guys. All right, sorry about that. So it's about three minutes long that I'm gonna play. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP, but very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose, what's your cause, what's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. 
And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done. That's how most sales is done. And that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do. We say how we're different or how we better. And we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage. It has, you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. A few years ago, Gateway came out with flat screen TVs. They're eminently qualified to make flat screen TVs. They've been making flat screen monitors for years. Nobody bought one. But if you don't know why you do what you do, and people respond to why you do what you do, then how will anybody, how will you ever get people to, to All right, so I thought that was a really great opening statement to kind of explain that how you share your story has a really big impact on the end user. Um, and he did a much better job explaining it than I would have. Um, but it is a reality in most situations that it's probable that somebody else is either selling something similar to what you sell or they're providing a service similar to what, what service you are providing. Um, and that's why it's so important to be sharing in this day and age what you do, why you do it, how you do it. Um, and sometimes it's really hard for us as I'm speaking from a producer standpoint, but you might be a small business owner or you might provide a service. Why, why do we do what we do? And sometimes we have to really break that down um, and think about how we tell that story to the consumer. So a lot of people tend to think that you have a great product or service, and that's it. That's the end of the journey. It's just going to fly off the shelf. Um, in a previous position, I worked for a small-scale business incubator. And what we saw so often with these small-scale food entrepreneurs is that really, really great products would fail and really not so great products would flourish. And it all came down to marketing um, and how these people told their story. Um, really, that's just when it starts, is you have this product, and how are you going to connect with your buyers? Because products rarely sell themselves off the shelf. So a lot of this boils down to what is your brand? And branding can sound like a really, really scary um, statement, because when we think of a brand, we think of the larger brands like Nike or Walmart. Um, and yes, those are really big brands and they're very prominent, but as a small business owner or a small producer that might be selling direct to consumer, you have a brand too. Um, who you are, what do you do? Why does it matter to the end consumer? And what ultimately sets you apart from others? And these are the pieces that you really have to break down and start sharing little pieces of this so that your consumer understands this about you. And this all comes down to a bunch of different things that you want to look cohesive. So your design, what your logo looks like, your diversity in the products that you offer, how you promote what you do, why you do, um, this all makes your brand.
And one thing with your branding too, it's not a static thing. So your brand is always going to pivot as your company pivots. Um, you know, what, what your brand was 10 years ago is not what your brand is going to be 10 years from now. So just understand that it's always going to be pivoting and changing as you go. So when you think about sharing your story, a couple things that we want to make note of. And when I say share your story, um, I'm sure most of you understand that doesn't mean sitting down and writing 18 pages, sending that out into the interweb and you're, you're done. You know, you've told your story. Um, but what that means is really sharing snippets of your life, your value, um, your why, your, um, you know, how you make your product and the way that you share that. So this is all a mix of different ways that you could share across uh, social media. So that's your Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, a website if you have one, face-to-face. -face. So this would be if you sell at, uh, if you have a retail location or if you're at farmer's markets during the week or on the weekends. Blogs, which a lot of times these are tied into a website if you have one. So writing more in depth about a particular topic um, which could go out to an email or it could be tied right to your website um, or product labels. So we are in the milk business. So our product labels like on a pint are, you know, one inch by three inches. So we don't have a lot of uh, space to tell our story. Um, but if you were an apple producer and you're selling a bag of apples, sometimes there's a lot more space on there that you could tell a little bit about what's important to you. And we would love to hear if you guys could drop in the chat, which of these are you using? Are you using Facebook, TikTok? Do you have a website? Um, are you doing farmer's markets? So we'd love to hear what you guys are doing if you can drop that in the chat. Social media. Anybody else? Farmers Markets, Facebook, website, Instagram Reels. Yeah, and most of the time there's going to be more than one, right? It's a mix and sometimes that mix changes as our business does. Facebook, Farmers Market. Awesome, thank you guys. That's great to see. And with social media, it's funny because we hear from a lot of people that social media really isn't their thing. Um, they don't personally like social media, but there is no denying that for a small business, social media is a resource. Um, it's a great way to promote what you do for a very reasonable fee. Most of the time you can do it for nothing unless you choose to boost posts or um, do some paid Facebook ads. But it is certainly a resource to build a community around your products or services. So a little bit into how we use it as a business. Um, one thing, I use both Instagram and Facebook. Um, and with Instagram, if you tie the two together, when you post on Instagram, it automatically posts to Facebook. So if that's an option for you and your business, it's really kind of a double whammy with not a lot of um, time, extra time on your part. So if you can get those two connected, and I think that has to be done through Instagram, then you can kind of hit both platforms without adding extra time into your day because it does take time to do these things. Um, personally, for our farm business, I've started using stories quite a bit more. Um, stories are the piece at the top of the screen that typically they disappear after 24 hours, but there's a lot less pressure um, with the Instagram stories to be polished. So it's more of like a small snippet of your life. Um, you you have the option to add text if you want to, um, but you're not writing full paragraphs and it, you don't have to show perfection here. Um, so I think it's a much easier way to show more of the day-to-day, -day, more of the day-to-day -day in the moment uh, 
parts of your story um, than doing an actual poster or reel, which sometimes can take more time. So for me personally, I like the stories um, that allows me to add, you know, a couple pictures during the day that shows kind of what we're doing, what my husband's doing, um, cute picture of a cow. So it just depends on what, what we have going on that day. For posting, um, this is going to differ probably depending on who you talk to. Um, I, I choose quality over quantity. I don't post anywhere near every day. Um, there are people that tell you you need to do that. But for us personally, with our business, I just don't have time to come up with that content every day, you know, and have the really well thought out posts to go with it. So should I be posting consistently? Probably. But right now for where we're at, I really like the stories, a little more informal. Um, and then when I have a really good idea for a reel or I have something I want my consumers to know, I'll do a more formalized post and send that out. And posts are the same. If you put a post on Instagram, that should go across Facebook as well. So again, you're hitting two platforms with one post. Um, reels, they're the same as posts. Um, I have been working to do more reels because the Facebook and Instagram algorithm really favors reels over posts, especially posting with only words. If you're putting a post on, you always want to have a picture to go with it. You never want to post just words because a lot of times it won't be seen. Um, always taking the time to engage with those that engage with our posts. So whether that's typing out a genuine answer, um, Anybody who takes the time to respond to what I put out there, we want to make sure as a business that we're responding back to that. So I do try really hard to do that. That also helps drive up your algorithm as well. Making sure, oh, the end of that was just making sure that um, I'm posting about things that my customers want to see. So for us, it's not always product related. So it's snippets of farm life. Sometimes it's something my kids are doing. Um, sometimes it's a joke about my husband. So it's not always product focused, um, just because I think that our consumers are interested in other things that we're doing on the farm as well. Um, this is an example of a post that I had put out before Christmas. Um, and I just wanted to make the point that we don't have to portray perfection all the time. So we had done one of our first batches of eggnog and my, my three-year-old at the time had gotten a hold of the labels and, and decided that he was going to label some eggnog for us. And obviously they don't look perfect here, but he did the best that he could. Um, so I just put a little line that said, if you see any milk labeled like this in the cooler, we just want you to know that our three-year-old Charlie takes his part-time job very seriously. He focuses heavily on precision and detail. Labels were applied with the utmost level of love and care. Um, people really related with that. They thought that was pretty humorous. Um, everybody came to our farm store to find the Charlie labeled eggnog. Um, that was the thing to buy that week. So it's just really interesting that that's what consumers seem to relate to. And I think a lot of times we can get caught up in trying to be perfect and trying to show, you know, just just this, you know, uh, this part of life that everything is perfect. The labels are on perfect. This is going so well. But I think that we forget that consumers really want to see um, our business is humanized because that's what makes us a small business. Like our corporations, they're perfect, right? Like when you see a post from Walmart or Dollar General or, you know, a, a larger corporation, they're not running their social media. Um, so they're never going to post something like this. Um, so I just think when, when you're thinking about social media, just get rid of that perfection piece of it. Pros and cons of using social media. It's a great way to show snippets of your story. Um, you can build a community here of like-minded people that are looking for your product. They want to hear more about you. They're there because they want to be. Um, 
but just don't get caught up in the followers. You know, sometimes maybe you feel like you don't have enough followers or what you're doing isn't working, but a lot of times your followers don't equal dollars, right? We want, the end goal is to have a sale. And even if you have 200 followers, they're there because they want to be, and that's really important. The con of uh, media, and I really wanted to talk about this just because of everything going on with TikTok. And if you aren't familiar with that, um, TikTok is at risk of being banned in the US. And TikTok also does a really good job at paying out people that make great content on TikTok. So if you have a something a reel or um, a video that goes viral on TikTok, you get paid out from that. So there's quite a few people that have built businesses around that and spent a lot of resources into building up their community there. But when you don't own your platform and you don't own, you know, the people there, that means if that gets wiped out, all of those small businesses lose that and there's nothing they can do because they don't own it. So I think that that's really important to take into consideration um, as we cover the other ways that you can market and brand your business. So yes, it's a great resource. Um, it's great to utilize for telling your story, but just don't put all your ducks in one basket because of things like that. Um, there have also been many, many instances of hacking. Um, your account can be hacked and it can be really, really difficult to get back or there is the possibility that you don't get it back at all. So if you only have, you know, one social media platform, you put all your resources into that. And for some reason you get hacked and you lose it all. That's going to be real tough to swallow for sure. So that's why diversification is key um, when you're marketing your business, just to make sure if something like that happens, you don't lose everything that you've put your time into. The other con of social media that I'm sure some of you have seen is that Facebook and Instagram can really limit who sees your post. And I saw a statistic that about 10% of your actual followers actually see your post. So when you put it out there, you assume that everybody is seeing what, what you have to offer, everybody's seeing you, you know, your service, and that's not the case. A lot of it has to do with the algorithm and that changes frequently. So it can be difficult to figure out um, you know, sometimes it's the time of day. Sometimes it's, you know, the verbiage that you put with it. Um, I just learned recently that Facebook doesn't like the word sale or selling. So if you put that in your post, it really limits what you're trying to do. So just some things to keep in mind. Now, one of my biggest mistakes as a small business owner is when we started, and I told you this earlier, but I went right to social media. I didn't realize the value that a website would bring to our business. So I didn't start working on a website till we had been in business over two years. Um, and I really think that that was a huge mistake because number one, not everybody has social media. Um, and number two, I think that there's more authenticity to a website. Um, there's a lot more information condensed down into one spot. So even if you could have a website and just have one landing page to start out with um, and explain a little bit about who you are and what you do, why you do it, that would be really, really beneficial to your business. Um, there's a lot of platforms out there that are very easy to use and user-friendly, like Wix. Um, that's what we did ours on. And really easy to change things. You can add to it. Um, and it doesn't have to be perfect when you start. You know, you can start with one to two pages for a website and add from there. The great thing about your website is that you own it. You are in control. You know, as long as you buy that domain or pay for that domain each year, you control that. And the same with an email list. I've heard from multiple, multiple direct-to-consumer businesses that their email list is what garners the most revenue for them. Um, and that's something that I wish that I had done from the start was gather those emails to start an email list um, and then do consistent emails each week. And that's something I'm working on doing now, but um, don't make the same mistake I did. So if you have the chance to do that, or if you're already doing that, good for you. Um, I know that I receive some farm emails from farms that I follow and I open them all the time. Um, just to read about what they're doing. They go go more in depth about 
life on the farm, what they're doing this week, and then putting that call to action button at the bottom, you know, shop here for this new product or something along those lines where they're telling their story, telling what they're doing, and then having that call to action at the bottom of that. Um, and the great thing is at the end of the day, that email list is yours. They've given you permission to email them um, and the website is yours as well. So you just have more control over that. And I thought this was an interesting statistic that the About Us pages of a website are one of the most visited pages for any small business website. Um, now that I do have a website, it's tied to my cell phone. So when somebody signs onto our web page, I get a ping and it tells me where the person is from and what page they're on. And 95% of the time, within three seconds, they're on our About the Farm page. Um, so that was a really big eye opener for me. So if you are going to start a web page, if you don't have one already, this would be the one thing I would tell you to build out the most. Um, tell what sets you apart, what makes you different, and why you're doing what you're doing. And can you guys drop in the chat below if you guys have a website already? This is um, just a really interesting example of an about us that I thought they did a really great job of separating themselves and just being really brutally honest in a way that would connect to the consumer. So I'm just going to read a couple of the sentences that I felt like um, set them apart. Uh, both only 24 at the time, we leased a building, got some scary bank loans, spent all our money on stainless steel, and started making some hardcore craft beers. We brewed tiny batches, filled bottles by hand, and sold our beers at local markets and out of the back of our beat-up old van. Our biggest mission when we set up BrewDog was to make other people as passionate about great craft beer as we are, and that is still our biggest mission today. So here they're telling you about their scary bank loans, they spent it all on stainless steel, and then they delivered it out of the back of their, you know, old van which I think right there makes you want to like them, right? They're the underdog. They did whatever it had to take. Um, so I just think that they did a really, really great job in explaining that in a short, concise way. It's not lengthy, um, but they did tell you uh, quite a bit about their story there. Oh, we got some websites. Yes, I have a website, not for the farm. Maybe like 50-50 it looks like, about half do, half, half don't. Awesome. So I just wanted to go through um, and really get your gears grinding on what do your consumers want to know? Um, and I think to preface this, I just want to say, just remember that things that you feel like are mundane that you might do day to day is not what your consumer will think is mundane. A lot of times they like to see the behind the scenes, you know, um, you might feed cows every morning, 365 days a year, but that's something that they don't get to see all the time. So they might like to see the explanation or a short video of that. Um, and with that, you can start answering questions like these. So which problem do you solve? And really think about that as a business, what problem are you solving for the consumer? And be really honest with yourself about that. Which insight sparked the start or pivoting of your business? For us, it was COVID. I think it was that for quite a few small businesses across the country. Um, but really dive into that. Why? What did start it? Wasn't that an idea? Was it, um, you know, was it something that happened in your life? You know, really dive into that and, and start building that out. What are you doing now to fix the problem for the consumer? And what's your mission? Sometimes for me, it helps to talk these out with other people too. Um, I have a hard time sometimes verbalizing what I really want to say to the end consumer. So, you know, if you have a, a friend or family member that you can hash some of these out with, that can be really beneficial as well. How did you get started? What motivates and inspires you every day? Can you identify your values and how do you incorporate them into your business? What problem does your business help solve? What solution do you provide? Why is this important to you? You know, and going back to that short video um, that I played earlier, what's what's the who, what, how? 
you know, or, or the why, what is the why behind what you're doing? Um, one thing that I would really tell you is to be authentic. Um, you really want everything you do. So whether that's your website, your emails, your, your social media platform, you really want your personality to come through and you want it to be an authentic representation of your brand. Um, I really prefer to kind of be conversational only because I don't want to come off like we're a big business. You know, we're not uh, Nike. We're not Under Armour. You know, we're a really small family run business um, with a, a set of values that we hope to portray to the customer. Um, and you want to make sure that across all platforms, you're being as consistent as possible. So that you're not saying on one platform that you're the you're the cheapest, you know, I'm always going to be the lowest price. And then on another platform, you're saying, you know, what we do best is quality. You know, those those things don't necessarily align. So you just want to make sure that you, your overall message is the same across all the platforms. Um, getting personal, you know, people like Again, going back to that humanization of your business, they like to know that you're not corporate America. They like to know that you're human, um, that you make mistakes um, and getting vulnerable. People really connect with that. It makes your business personable. Um, it makes you authentic. So that's really, really important as you get out there and start to tell little snippets of your story and what you're doing. Um, and it doesn't have to be perfect. I've said that time and time again. I think that I get the most traction off of the posts that show that we are by far not perfect. Um, you know, where I, I try to use humor and sarcasm to show when something doesn't go right on the farm or doesn't go right when we're processing milk. Um, and I think that people really appreciate that. And just going back to, you know, you don't have to do all of these things at once, um, but start somewhere. Start with one thing, whether it's a website, start gathering emails, start with Facebook, start with Instagram, start with whatever you are most comfortable with. And that's going to be different for everybody. Um, and this quote says, if I waited until I had all my ducks in a row, I'd never get across the street. Sometimes you have to gather up what you've got to make a run for it. And that's honestly what I'm best at. You know, I don't have um, I don't have it together all the time, but sometimes you just have to start and get that forward motion. Um, and that forward motion helps you kind of get everything else across the street. So if that was my advice, I would tell you just to start with something, um, especially if you don't have anything. Start with one thing and then grow it from there. So it's it's less overwhelming for you as a business owner. And my last um, tidbit of advice is my dad was a, a salesman his entire life. And he always told me he was in uh, golf course sales. So he would um, sell them grass seed and, and different things like that. And he uh, worked for a couple different businesses throughout his career. And one thing that he always told me when I was a kid is that no matter what people buy from people, you know, if they feel like they have a connection to you, even if somebody else has something cheaper um, or they have the same product, if they like you and they resonate with your values um, and your mission and what you're doing, they're going to continue to buy from you because you're the person selling it. So I think that that's really important um, for why, as business owners, we need to tell the consumers our story, tell them why we do what we do, how we do what we do, and just continue on with that transparency um, so we can find the, the consumers that best fit what we have to offer. Is there any questions? So again, we just want to thank Sammy um, for being a part of today's program and throughout the whole series. Um, please share your questions and then we will finish up. And just as a reminder, there will be a survey at the end of the program, but please feel free to share your questions. Um, you should be able to unmute yourself, but the chat box will work best. No questions, I can't believe that.
We have had quite a few questions as well as emails um, asking if the ses sessions are going to be recorded and available. Yes, they are recorded and we are uploading them on our um, YouTube, YouTube page, um, CC Oneida. All right, so looks like we have a question. Do you obtain an email list just by asking for a person's address? Um, you can. So I have just a printed, you know, Excel spreadsheet that I printed out to ask for their name and address. Um, but also um, on my web page, if you sign on to that, there's a section that says, you know, to hear more from us, enter your email here. And that signs people up. Um, another thing that's worked well if you do a lot of events is using a QR code so that if somebody standing at your table likes what they see, they can just scan that QR code and it automatically brings up our, um, our little box to put in their information to sign up for emails. So there's a couple different ways to do that. Is there a cost to have a website? There is a cost um, and it differs depending on what domain that you're using. Um, I'm not super familiar with it, but I know we purchased ours, I think for five, like the fir first five years. And it was very reasonable, um, especially seeing now how many hits we get to our website. I mean, it's much more valuable than I realized. So it's well worth the cost, I would say. Great question, Dr. Johnson. We'll give a few more minutes, seconds. Um, but again, thank you, Sammy, for participating today and sharing your story. And we hope we've got some brains turning. Um, so we will be hosting the next Lunch and Munch session on April 9th. Also want to remind you to follow our CCO Nida County Facebook page. Um, we have are constantly posting programs, opportunities for you to participate, as well as in the beginning of the session, if you were able to capture the video that we had playing, we have a farmer's symposium coming up on April 5th. That's going to be talking a little bit about farmer school and working with the farmer school program if you'd be interested in um, participating in that. And if you're a vegetable grower and working with Ag and Markets through the inspection process. We also have a PSA, uh, Producer Safety Alliance for Training, coming up April 16th, April 11th, here at CCO NIDA. Um, that is a full day program. There is a cost of $50, but you can reach out to me to register or um, call our office. And lastly, we do have quick updates today. We will be hosting our second in-person session at the Thinkubator, um, hosted with SPDC on April 16th. That is a full three-day session. Um, that session will be focused on value-added food producers, um, but farmers are also welcome to come. And that's a full day event, 10 to three, we'll have breakout sessions. And again, it's free with lunch and food. Um, thank you again for joining today. We look forward to seeing you on April 9th. Please feel free to reach out with any questions to my email. And again, this session has been recorded. We are going to end the program now, and there will be a quick survey. Um, please feel free to answer. Thanks. Have a great day, everyone.